There's a lot of confusion when it comes to the subject of Hindus' appreciation of cows. What is the basis of this? The way Hinduism has been portrayed in the West has always been, in a way, in a very poor light. In many schools, the only exposure of Hinduism is caste system. And all of us here are saying, yeah, I thought I'm a Brahmin, he's a Loano. There's a caste system, surely. And the second way is polytheism, many gods. Yeah, we have look, we go in the temple. And the third one is, they actually worship cows. What a silly religion. And sometimes when they want to de deride Hinduism, this I have come across in some school, they say they drink cow's urine before they come to school. This is, I'm warning you, this is how your children are told. They are daunted in school saying, did you drink some urine before you came here? Cow's urine, of course. Let me tidy up and let me clarify. You must be very clear about these things and you must make your children aware of the true answers. Remove the misconception. Then the thing that was making them feel kind of dejected and perhaps you know, under, under pressure, under duress, will suddenly turn around and hold their hand and make say, yeah, there's this good stuff here. Let me tell the story. You see, I go to lots of English schools and um, I say, <clears throat> would you, you know, you eat meat? They say, sure, we eat meat. I say, oh, fair enough, you know, you can eat meat. I, I'm not here to stop you. And you see, this rover, your dog, is getting old now. And you're going to lose him in no time because, you know, he's getting old and you love your rover, don't you? They say, of course, we love our rover, Mr. Lakhani. I say, there's one trick you can use whereby rover is never parted from you. He'll be part and parcel of you forever and ever. And of course, Mr. Smith, the Englishman, says, this is fantastic. What is the way whereby I'm never separated from my rover? And my answer would be, you know, Mr. Smith, you eat meat. Why don't you have rover for supper? Now you are sniggering because you know what I mean. Not me saying put, put rover on the, table, on the table and say let's share our dinner. But actually cook up rover and have him for dinner. If I ever say that to any English person, immediately he'll take his stick out and chase me around the park. How dare you? Dog is man's best friend. You don't eat your best friend. What a stupid thing to suggest even. You, you see, if you are in Vietnam, you might be eating dog's meat. If in the United Kingdom, if you start selling real hot dogs, there'll be the council will come and shut you down. Dog? You don't. This is dog's meat. You don't. Dog is man's best friend. For the Hindu, this, we are very well thought, this really is very well thought out. Don't underestimate it. We say man's best friend is not the dog, not the horse. Man's best friend for thousands of years. Go look at the history of humanity. You know what is humanity's history? Until about 10,000 years, we were roaming around, you know, hunter-gatherers, just running around any animal we can kill and eat and we go next, next to the next animal. Hunter-gatherers is the human history. The only time human beings settled down and started to farm and become a little bit civilized is when they had this lovely animal they called the cow. Because it's a magic machine. On one end you put grass, other end milk comes out. So you could settle down. You had a ready flow of supply of proteins. So you could settle down and wait for your, for your crops to grow. So this gentle animal, if we study the history of humanity, has been the major friend of humanity that allowed humanity to become civilized, to settle down and be civilized, have the space to be civilized. So we say, if you wish to pay tribute to one animal as man's best friend, it's not the dog. It's this gentle animal called the cow. So the Hindus say, we must pay respect to this animal that has stood by humanity for such a long time. Not just Hindus, for whole of humanity. Must pay a tribute. And some people say, but Mr. Lakhani, then the goats give milk as well, so shouldn't you? I say, fair enough. Revere the goat as well. We don't mind. But somehow the cow has been, the, if you like, the, the icon of an animal that stood by humanity. That's why it has been given this prominent position. The Hindus don't drag a cow in the temple and say, I worship you. Not that it's Hindus are allowed to do that, by the way. But the fact that they revere the animal, they respect the animal, because it, they, in a way, are paying tribute to what the animal has done for us. I'm, I'm guaranteeing you, you tell this to, of course, I'm not very good advertisement for McDonald's, but this idea of revering this gentle animal for what it has done, shows that we are truly, you know, extending this, if you like, the idea of reverence for life into the animal kingdom. And the one animal that stands out saying, me first, is this gentle animal, the cow. So suddenly the holy cow suddenly becomes, oh, it's a lovely animal. 
Of course, the only drawback is you can take the dog for a walk, you can't take the cow for a walk, but so be it. Intense of fasting and meditation. You see, we are told, okay, a particular special holy day is coming, a holy day, H-O-L-Y, and uh, for that you need to fast for the whole day and then perhaps in the evening break your fast or the next morning with Shivaratri, next morning break your fast. Why are we fasting? When there's food, common sense suggests eat, surely. It's natural. So why are we being unnatural? It's an important question. And this is true for every religion. They all have this kind of disciplines. The answer is precisely <laughs> this. In order for us to reacquaint ourselves with our inner being, our spiritual dimension, which is not our body or the mind, this is what we are teaching, that your essential nature is the spirit. In order to re you know, try and re-establish a link with yourself as a spirit, we are very much special than we, you know, we always look at the body and say, oh, that's me, that's not you, that's your external part. Then you look at your mind and say, I'm that intelligent person who can talk and think and rationalize. That not to you, that's not you either, that's just still your external part. The underpinning to you that is looking out through your eyes, staring at the whole of this creation, is you. We want to try and link up with this essential you, your essential nature, the spirit. Now, in order for us to acquire this habit of linking with our deeper dimension, our real being, our real essential nature, we say you need to put in certain disciplines which will force you to think that you are not the body or the mind or not to pay attention to your body and the mind. To try and for you, you see, how do I show that I am much more than just an animal? Animal will see grass, it will start grazing. A human being said, today there is food in front of me, I am not going to eat it. I am showing my true dignity by being more than an animal, more than if you like this kind of just a thinking animal. I have got the power to stand away, you know, stand aside or stand apart from all this kind of thing which animal feature that I possess. I can stand away from it. The idea is to reassert our essential nature as different from the body and the mind and this, this appears as discipline. So you might have certain discipline, you may say, I will not drink any water, I will not speak today, I will not eat today or I will only eat fruit today. You are in a way trying to reassert to yourself that I am much more than just an animal. I can stand up against animal forces. So it's a discipline, a necessary discipline. That is what we do. That is why we do the fasting, to show that we are, can stand apart from the animal kingdom. We are now, see look, Hindus agree with the theory of evolution. You come out of the animal kingdom, you enter the human kingdom, we have no difficulty with Darwin. From the, from the human kingdom, we say don't stop there. The evolution has not stopped. From the human, we want to aspire to the divine. There's something much more to us than meets the eye. So in order for us to now continue the journey from the human, from the animal to the human, to the, from the human to the humane, to the divine, we need this discipline, dignity. I'm much more than a body. So the bodily functions I can hold. Now the idea of meditation also is in a way a discipline. Because you are telling, telling yourself that just as you can hold your you know, body away from your food and say, no, I will not you know, uh, you know, chase after food. In the same way, you'll say the mental vagaries of my mind, you know, the thought waves that come, they keep kind of stealing me away because your mind, you know, the modulation of your mind in a way distracts you from your essential nature. So we say the modification of the mind, if I can hold them still, I can discern myself as different from the mind because we get caught up with what our mind tells us we are. We want to stand aside from that. Just as you want to stand aside from that idea that I am the body, you do it through discipline of say, fasting. In the same way, when you close your eyes and say, I am not the mind, forget about the body, you want to hold the body still, so that's forgotten, hopefully. But the mind gets in the way and it throws up all the waves, all the <laughs> thought waves, the desires, all ideas keep popping up. You are saying, now I want to discern, I want to see that I am different from the mind. That's the idea of meditation. So you are trying to discipline the mind now. The first discipline is trying to discipline the body or your, of, your, of your physical needs. The second is to discipline your mind. You asked me such a lovely question, my daughter. Because if you can control, can stand aside from your body and the mind, you discover, rediscover your essential nature as the spirit, Atman. You are that. And you lost track of that. That is why we are struggling in the human condition. And the resolution of the human condition is to rediscover our essential nature as the spirit. Look, I must say this. What is the heart of Hinduism? It's not just believing in God, cracking coconuts, doing liturgy. The heart of Hinduism is to experience this thing called religion for ourselves. Don't just believe and sit, sit on the sideline. 
experience what you are talking about. Suppose there is a spirit underpinning, there is something special about this world. What is it? I want to come face to face with it. And these disciplines in a way allow us to regain. In the Christian readings they regain the kingdom of heaven which is within you. See, same idea, different metaphor. We are saying rediscover your essential. You are the spirit, my boy. You are the spirit. You are that. What you are searching for in the sixth, in the highest heaven is your essential nature. You have lost track of it. And through all these various approaches, through rituals, through narratives, through worshipping, you are trying to regain that essential dignity, your own dignity. You are the spirit. Such lovely stuff doesn't come out of other religions that easily. It divinifies whole of humanity. It lifts whole of humanity up to the level of God. This is the, the, the lovely ideas of Hinduism.